again welcome to another video um i'm sitting down it's been a while since i've done a sit down video we've been heading out a lot recently we've been on lots of adventures we've had lots of lovely days out and lots of lovely fun things to do but it has meant that i haven't had a lot of time to sit down and do any talky videos and i've kind of forgotten how it works <laughs> i am a little out of practice to try and ease me back into the whole sit down talking about books videos I thought I would just have a really casual chatty video where I talk about some of the books that I've read recently in September and October. So I read 32 books in both September and October. That wasn't deliberate. I wasn't like aiming for a number. That's just how it turned out. And I also DNF'd quite a few. Like I lost count if I'm honest. I got really picky in October. I was just like, nah, I'm not enjoying this. Put it down. I'm done with you. I don't have time. I don't have time. Book talk I found can also be a tricky beast because sometimes someone will put like a quote on a video and I'll be like, that quote sounds amazing. And then I'll read the book and be like, nah, this that quote was the best bit in that book, wasn't it? <laughs> so I've had some real hits from book talk, but I've also had some real misses. I'm not going to go into too much detail about those. I really want this to be a positive video. And I don't want to spend too much time talking about books I didn't enjoy. Instead, I want to share with you some books that I did. These are not necessarily all five star reads, but they are books that have stood out to me or series that have stood out for me for one reason or another and books that really just I want to talk about. That's all there is to it, really. They're also not in any particular order, but I have tried to group them together in some sort of uh, category based. I don't know. I've tried to have a system. OK, so without bleating on anymore. Let's get stuck in, starting with an old, reliable, historical romance. So I am a big, big, big fan of Emma V. Leach. She is a historical author who has written bags of historical books. The series that I've read the most of, I think, were the Girls Who Dare series, which is, surprisingly, a series about a group of young women who are all friends, who all take dares to kiss a guy at midnight or sneak out in boys clothing or whatever it is and each of those dares leads to them meeting the love of their life and happy ever after blah 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 you get the drift at the moment i'm currently reading her follow-up series to that which is the daring daughters which is literally the daughters of the couples that were made in the girls who dare series so it's like one huge sequel series she has also just announced that she's doing another sequel series which will focus on the sons of those families so i'll be reading that as well but in september and october i read to dare the darkness i think and wildly daring which are the next two books in this series to dare the darkness may be like the most anticipated book in this entire series because it features evie and louis whose relationship has been teased for so many books like books and books and books and books and books have had these two characters clearly falling in love clearly into each other and not yet getting together and finally finally we got to see them actually get it together i think it was always going to be really really difficult for this book to live up to my expectations because my expectations were high i loved this couple in a lot of the other previous books but i'd almost seen too much of them We'd done the legwork because we'd seen that they were both into each other. They both now knew they were into each other and they had even sort of started to have a relationship. It was a secret relationship, but they, they'd even told each other that they were into each other. So all of the hard work of this other romance had already been done before we even got into To Dare a Darkness. So when we start this book, they're basically just trying to figure out how they can be together. Louis has a darker background from his time in France, which Evie's parents are a little bit wary of. And they're not 100% sure that they're going to be able to be open about the fact that they want to be together. Through a sort of series of unfortunate events situation at a ball, Louis actually ends up kidnapping Evie and taking her away and being like, we're just gonna, we're just gonna run away and we'll sort this all out later. I don't know what to do and then they are in France and they've got to unpick all of this mess. Evie is, she's an interesting character because she is in love with Louis and she is completely smitten with him and she desperately wants to be with him but she is angry with him and she does make him sort of like suffer at the beginning of the book for 
what she sees as being this horrible thing. She's, he's caused this huge scandal, he's caused problems with her parents and her family. It's going to be a big thing they're going to have to get around. And she's living with him and she's like, dude, why have you done this? And she makes him pay for it and there's some groveling that has to be done and all the rest of it. So I did enjoy this book and I did enjoy finally getting to see Evie and Lee get together and I did enjoy finally getting to see the happy ever after, but it did feel a little bit like the third act of a book that had already happened and I would normally say with this series that you could pretty much pick up any of the books out of order and read it and you would still grasp the plot and you'd still be able to follow along but this one I think if you hadn't read the rest of the books in the series and there are like 14 or something then you might struggle to pick this up because you are really going to need some of that background. The next book in the series was Wildly Daring. This was almost completely the opposite because this featured Kara and Wolfric, who we had met both of these characters before, but they hadn't really at any point been the predominant character in any of the books. They hadn't had big moments and they hadn't met, most importantly, before the start of this book. So this book, you could pretty much pick up and read it, having never read any of the rest of the series, and you would be able to grasp their relationship. I really really enjoyed this one as well. I mean I love all of Emma V. Leach's stories. They're very accessible, they're very easy to read because they don't challenge me particularly. They have just enough drama and just enough angst and just enough threat and peril to make them exciting but they're also really comforting and just oh they're a nice hot bath of a book. I love them. This one was a lot of fun because it was a different social classes kind of story. Wolfric is from the wrong side of the tracks in France. He is a member of the aristocracy in England, but kind of a black sheep lost member of the family. So he's not really accepted by society and everything. And Cara is a young lady from a very respected family. And, you know, she's all set in society to go off and, and make a good match. And, and they meet when Wolf steals a letter from one of her friends and starts writing to her as a pen pal. And they write to each other for like two years secretly with no one knowing. And they don't really, she doesn't know who he is because he never actually reveals his identity to her. And then two years later into the future, he arrives in England to reclaim his place in society and then they meet. And I appreciated this book for two, two, two reasons. I think two, <laughs> maybe more, but definitely two. Number one is they didn't drag out that whole mysterious, secret identity thing for long. Almost as soon as Wolf arrives in England and he meets Kara in person, she figures out who he is, like, very, very quickly. There's not, it's not drawn out, it's not like lots of sneaking around hiding his identity. That is out there almost straight away. And number two, as I said, this is a different social classes kind of story. Wolf is a experienced, dashing, sort of roguish character and Kara is your innocent young miss. But that is not the dynamic of their relationship. I think we've read that book a thousand times. I love that book. I have no issue with that book. But the book where the roguish, rough character seduces and wins over the naive, innocent debutante, that is not this one. If anything, Kara is totally in the lead. She is taking control of the relationship. She pursues him. She seduces him. I just... I love the dynamic between the two of them. He is completely smitten with her from day one. She feels the same. And they both feel that they, they know each other already. They've done all the legwork. They've been speaking to each other for years. They just now have to actually figure out how this is going to work in the actual real world. And she just takes no crap. She's a bit accident prone. She's a bit of a catastrophe waiting to happen. And he constantly is having to drag her out of all the messes that she finds herself in. But I just really, really enjoyed their relationship. It was incredibly cute. And as usual, we do get to see little glimpses of other characters from previous novels. So you get to see like how they're getting on and how their lives are progressing. And also, as usual, it sets up a couple of relationships for future books, which I am very much looking forward to because this, as I said, is just one of my comfort series. I just love it. So then also in hysterical, hysterical? historical romance but a new to me author this time i read the monster of montvale hall and the angel of avondale abbey by nadine millard and these are again historical romances i wouldn't say they're necessarily groundbreaking i think a lot of people wouldn't consider these to be particularly standout blow you away kind of books but for me again they were just really solid historical romances they they had all of the tropes you would want without feeling overly cliched in book one we have oh my god is his name robert or rupert it's one of these things i'm no good with names but you have your hero who is your sort of 
typical damaged hero. He had a traumatic experience in his childhood involving his little sister, which has left him incredibly just miserable. <laughs> I guess just miserable and he has shut himself off from the board and he stays in his house with his mum and he really doesn't have a lot of interaction with the real world and meanwhile the heroine turns up she's an American lady who has come to England to have a season and her and her cousin are staying with the hero for like a little while and she obviously like brings him out of his shell and like I said it's really nothing groundbreaking I couldn't say there's anything here that's like wow that broke the mold that did something really new but they were just really reliable solid romances and sometimes that is exactly what i'm in the mood for and the second book in the series the angel of avondale abbey is the story of the cousin from the previous book that we met he gets called home on an emergency he arrives home to discover that he has a niece that he didn't know about from his brother his brother is dead and the niece is being escorted by this mysterious young woman that he doesn't know there's a whole mystery surrounding what happened to the brother and he has to unpick all of that and sort that all out while looking after the niece and while falling for the mysterious young woman. Again, nothing revolutionary in terms of romance, but just really sweet and nice and enjoyable and steamy and I really enjoyed it. There are, I think, at least two other books in the series that I haven't read yet, but I will be reading them at some point. And I will keep an eye on this author because I figure if I'm just after just a good old reliable historical romance, then this seems like a pretty safe bet to me. So while we're on the subject, let's talk about some other series that I've been continuing in September and October. So first up we have Lily Gold's, I don't think it's like an actual linked series, but just let's say books Why Choose Polly Romances by Lily Gold. She's written a few, I've read now a few more of them. So in September and October I read Triple Duty Bodyguards and Three Swedish Mountain Men and I absolutely love these. These books are contemporary why choose poly romances they all feature one heroine and i think they all feature three heroes yes they, these both do my particular favorite out of these two was the triple duty bodyguards i really really liked the different dynamic between the heroine and the heroes all of the books do a different circumstance under which these heroines meet in this situation we have i feel like her name's blair but i could literally be making that up we have a heroine who was a famous actress who has a stalker. She has quite an upsetting incident at the beginning of the book and she needs bodyguards and she hires these three guys to come and be her bodyguards and in Lily Gold's books each of the guys always has their own sort of baggage, their own history and they also all take to the heroine in a different way so some will automatically be interested in her some will be really caring towards her some will not like her and that's very true in this case you get the one who instantly sort of like is looking out for her and they end up in bed together very quickly you have like another one who is absolutely against her and doesn't like her and thinks she's really stuck up a heroine has a bit of a reputation for being a bit of a bitch she comes across as quite sort of confrontational um, in the media and she's known for being sort of just a bit of a nightmare diva and so some of the guys assume that's who she's going to be and judge her accordingly and I really really liked how that's all developed and how their relationship continues and I really enjoyed watching them realise how much the stalking was affecting her and how much she was struggling with that and she has panic attacks and they have to look after her and oh I, I loved it I loved it who wouldn't want three handsome burly bodyguards protecting you and looking after you all the time i can think of worse things this book does also end with quite a quite a graphic if i remember rightly quite a graphic like final confrontation with the stalker that was a little bit scary but it's okay it's a romance novel it all ends happily that's why i love them but yes this was probably my favorite one of the ones the lily gold books that i've read so far but then three swedish mountain men again completely different setup we have a heroine who has left England in disgrace because... Is this the revenge porn one? I think it's to do with revenge porn. I think like her partner has released a video of her and she's lost her job and all of her friends hate her and she's had to run away. And she ends up in Sweden, stranded in a log cabin with three incredibly good looking men. <laughs> um, oh no. And again each of the guys has their own baggage they all have their own backstories they all have their own sort of um histories that they have to deal with 
and some of them are really happy to have this young willing beautiful female in their cabin and others are not so happy and the Lily Gold books are simultaneously so funny, so sweet and so sexy. They're just like the perfect blend for me of what a romance novel needs to do. They don't take themselves too seriously but at the same time they are not parodies or mocking the genre. Just really really enjoyed them. I believe she has written another one or is writing another one that's coming out soon. So I will be keeping my eyes out for that one because she's definitely an author that has made her mark on me this month. And another series that I think everybody is talking about is the salacious players club and in september i read mercy which is the fourth book in the series this is maggie's story obviously and is it beau is beau the son beau who is the son of emerson from book one praise so i have read all the books in this series so far give me more is by far my favorite because reasons <laughs> <laughs> what I like about the Salacious Players Club is I think what Sarah Kate does really 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 well is each book caters to a different preference shall we say. I think sometimes when you read a series which features around a sex club or BDSM or whatever they can all be very very similar because they tend to feature one very specific kink and that's all that you really get out of them. Salacious Player Club there is something for everybody in here like no matter what your flavour something in here will probably work for you and that's what I really enjoy so even though for me personally Mercy is not a hundred percent my cup of tea like dominant older female submissive younger male not what I would usually be picking up it still really works it's still beautifully written the characters are still amazing and you can still really get behind it even if that's not necessarily what you would usually be reading so I absolutely love Sarah Kate. I think I've read... I don't think I've read everything she's written so far. I think there are a few others that I've read. But I have read quite a few of hers now. And she's such a solid author. And she's so clever. And she's so... I don't know. She's she's one of those authors who's incredibly good at blending steam and story. I think sometimes you can lose one or the other. And she manages to blend the two beautifully. 100% five-star author. Love her. There are going to be more Salacious Players Club books and I can't wait to see where we go next. I'm very, very excited. I am also currently listening to Give Me More on audio, which is an experience, I can tell you. But yeah, that's really good as well. Three different actors, which I really like. So highly recommend. All of her stuff, highly recommend. So now I'm going to talk about a few new to me authors. And these are authors that I feel like maybe everybody else in the world has read, but I hadn't up until recently. And the first one is Elsie Silver, and of course, of course, I'm talking about Flawless and Heartless. Isn't everybody talking about these at the moment? Like, they're everywhere. Everybody I know is reading these books, and for very good reason. So these books are both in a small town setting, but I wouldn't say they necessarily felt to me like small town books. I think sometimes in books that are small town, it feels like that is the plot in itself, is that they live in this town. And this, the plot was definitely the couple, it was definitely the romance, it was definitely the situations that they found themselves in. It just so happened that they were in a small town where lots of people knew lots of people. And I really, really enjoyed them. Flawless is a kind of cowboy romance. Um, our hero is a rodeo star, sort of disgraced. <laughs> He's got a bit of a bad rep. And the heroine is a... They call them PR people who comes in to clean up his reputation and of course they fall in love. Lots of banter, lots of steam, just just loved it, absolutely loved it. Was, you know, everybody else raved about it. I can completely see why. Then I started to hear that Heartless was better, which was, you know, quite a feat. And they went wrong because Heartless was even better. This featured, one day I'll start making a note any of the character names of these books. So in Heartless we have Cade who is a single dad and Willa who is basically visiting friends for the summer and gets roped into being a nanny. Cade is not happy with the situation at the first. Willa is not the kind of person that he thought was going to be looking after his kid and at first he really doesn't like her. They have a lot of banter. She is a sassy little minx. I just loved her. She was such a fun character. I always love it when a heroine is like really feisty and gives the hero a run for his money. It's just one of my favourite tropes because I believe that's how all women should be. Thank you very much. 
and I just love it and I also love the fact that he sort of grudgingly respects her for it like he might not approve of her he may not enjoy having her around but at the same time he sort of can't deny that he likes her because she's just really funny and she's really just sussy and kick-ass and she's wonderful and most importantly she has a really really good relationship with his son which is obviously like the most important thing in a single dad romance i yeah just loved it lapped it up brilliant five stars all the stars elsie silver i feel like my kindle keeps offering me a lot of her books i need to go and read a few more of them because if they are anything like these two i'm gonna really enjoy them another new author that i feel like everybody on the planet has read but me is anna huang is that how I pronounce the name? I'm really, really sorry. I'm really, really bad at pronouncing any names ever. So I read the Twisted series first. Obviously, Twisted Love, Twisted Games, Twisted Lies and Twisted Hate. Um, and then I also recently read King of Wrath, which is, I think, like the spin-off series to those books. Um, I just I just loved them all, like all for different reasons. I think my favourite two were probably books two and book three. I can never remember which one of these books come in, like which one of the Twisted's was that but it was the one with Bridget and her bodyguard I love a good bodyguard romance and I thought that one was really cute and really funny and I really liked the dynamic between them but then I did also really love book three which was Jules and Josh twisted hate I think that one is and um, proper enemies to lovers vibes like full-on they loathe each other but it very quickly becomes an enemies with benefits situation which I can totally get behind uh, just yeah oh man I love this one this was so good so this series I think was definitely a TikTok win for me it absolutely lived up to expectations and like I said then I've read King of Wrath which was Dante's story who we had seen teased in the previous books and again just oh good goodness all the goodness I loved this arranged marriage just I feel like Anna just throws tropes at these books in the best possible way like she just she knows how to write a trope and she knows how to write it well and they're such easy reads like I read these all so so quickly I absorbed them I didn't read them so much as just like absorbing them into my brain and oh, I just love her she will be a one-click author from me from now on because if I can read five books of hers in two months and love them all that's pretty good going so now I want to talk about my one of my least favourite kinds of genre of books and two examples that I thought actually did really really well. These are books that are really angsty and messy and want to make you cry and mess with your feelings and I am not here for that, this is not what I'm reading romance for, but I loved these two so I will make an exception. So first up we have The Wrong Bride by Katharina Mora. Again, no idea if that's how you pronounce your name. I apologise in advance. I have read a lot of books by this author this year. She's a new to me author this year, but I think in August I read about six of her books. She's that good. The Wrong Bride is one of her books that I really, really enjoyed, but sort of didn't at the same time. This, oh, how do you describe it without giving too much away? Okay, what's on the blurb is basically a heroine whose name escapes me, as usual. Our heroine, Raven, is in love with her sister's fiance, Ares? I want to say Ares, like God of War. And he is engaged to her sister. They've been engaged for years. It's sort of like half arranged marriage, like merging two families, but the sister and the fiance are in love. They are very happy to be together and they are this perfect power couple everyone you know it, it it's all going swimmingly and then the sister gets cold feet and the sister for reasons there are reasons pulls out of the wedding at the very last minute and due to the arranged marriage side of it and the fact that these two families have to merge raven is forced to marry aries in her place at the very last minute this is not spoilers it's on the back of the book it's called The Wrong Bride. And she's, so here she is, married to a man who is in love with her sister. And this is where my particular problem started because it is messy, right? It is, it's proper angsty drama mess that I would normally avoid like the plague. Because Ares, at the beginning of this book, is definitely, or thinks he is, or acts like he is, in love with the sister, whose name escapes me. But she's irrelevant. And she, most importantly, is still kind of in love with Ares. 
and there's a moment like after the wedding when Raven is now married to this guy who she's been in love with for like her entire life and the sister comes in and she's like oh my god I can't believe you actually did it I didn't think you'd marry him and we were meant to be together and then she's like okay well we can wait for the three years of the arranged marriage and then you can just come back to me and it all ends up okay obviously because it's a romance novel it's Katharina Mora, so the writing is very beautiful, the writing is very good, but I kid you not, I had a massive lump, like, in my throat for the entire book. It made me so freaking uncomfortable, because angsty, love triangle shit is not what I'm here for, and I do not enjoy it. I did very much enjoy the book. I stuck it through, and I got to the end, and it was worth it, I think, but I do think I had a bit more grey hair by the end of it, and I've never been so tense or felt so icky reading a book just give me all the dark romance but don't give me love triangles and angst because I can't cope with it just can't so yeah loved the book hated the book at the same time you know what I mean love hate very close as we know in a very very similar thread very similar theme was Say You Swear by Megan Brady again we're kind of in love triangle territory and I do not like love triangles ask Bridget in season two I'm not here for them don't want them get in the bin Oh, <laughs> so beginning of Say We Swear, we meet Ari, 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 I don't know, her. We meet her and she is in love with Chase. Chase is her best friend's, no, Chase is her brother's best friend. She has been in love with him since the dawn of time. They are from a very, very close knit friendship group. They're all very close. They all hang out with each other all the time and they're all going off to university together. And she's in love with him. And at the beginning of the book she finally makes a move on him she gets rejected and then like a scene later they're banging they're at it i believe on a beach i can't remember um, <laughs> but they do the deed and then the next day it all goes horribly wrong he obviously thinks it was a mass mistake she's left heartbroken and she's damaged because this boy that she's been in love with forever doesn't want a relationship with her because he doesn't want to jeopardize the relationship with her brother. Meanwhile, she meets Noah, who is another guy in this friendship group. He's like on the same football team, I think. And Noah is smitten with Ari straight away. Like he is in 100%. But Ari, still all about Chase, still all about Chase. And so we have this love triangle situation at the beginning of the book where Ari is after Chase, but Noah's after Ari. And then slowly but surely, Noah gets into her good books and starts creeping in and they end up dating and it is all going swimmingly. And she is kind of over Chase and she is, you know, moving past it. And then, and we've already had too much angst and too much tension and too much love triangle bullshit going on for me to be 100% comfortable with the book before we get to the midway plot twist which just destroyed me like I was so freaking angry it was incredibly well done if you like angsty shit you'll probably love it like if you're into this kind of crap you'll probably be here for it I was fuming there is an incident which we cannot tell you about because it's spoiling it but there's an incident which basically fucks up all of the progress that we've made so far in this book and then some there's added drama there is added storylines that i really don't think were needed i could have ended this book after the halfway point and be quite happy she's just roused she's in love with noah and then it all goes to shit and you're back back at the end of the book in another love triangle situation and it's all messy and it's angsty and it genuinely is the only book this year that's actually made me cry like I genuinely was sobbing because I felt so bad for Noah in this situation because he was so just like in love with her and so helpless and so just oh my the angst it hurt it really did I was not I was not pleased I wasn't happy I really enjoyed the book I would absolutely read something again by this author but I would be very weary if she were to do the same thing again because Kennedy Ryan I think is a prime example of an author who I really 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 enjoyed her books until I realised that I was going to go through like an emotional distressing time every single time and that wasn't going to be okay with me and so I just stopped reading her but yeah say you swear if you want to be anxious and, and upset and emotionally damaged I recommend 
So now we're going to move on to one of my favourite topics, which is a little bit of dark romance. Um, who doesn't like some dark romance? I know it's a bit of a Marmite situation. Some people love it, some people hate it, some people cannot understand why you'd possibly want to read about people being kidnapped and tortured and, and you know, all manner of dubious things happening to them. But for those of us who know, we know. It's wonderful. And first up, I read Black Sheep by Bryn Weaver. This was popping up all over Instagram like about a month ago. Um, I think Tiff talked about it from Tiff Talks Pages. I can't remember. It was everywhere. Everyone was talking about it. And this is like another serial killer romance. And the reason I picked it up was because somebody said that if you liked the Mindfuck series, which I did, then you will like this. They weren't wrong. Our heroine is a student and our hero is a professor, but not her professor, importantly, because he won't cross that line because he's a good guy. And they are working together on this case, studying the psychology and the mentality of people in cults, because secretly, which nobody knows, she is trying to off all of the people who are involved with these cults. Meanwhile, he is helping the FBI to track them down. You see where the drama is coming from. I mean, this one, it, it is, it's dark, obviously. It handles some very, very dark themes. She is, like, just going around murdering people <laughs> left, right and centre. It's got proper Dexter vibes. She's got a code. She's been trained. Like, she had a mentor who taught her how to kill and how to cover it up and how to protect yourself and all the rest of it. I am always a little bit wary about books that glorify serial killing too much. Like, vigilante murdering, I think, is not something we possibly should be saying should be someone's life choices. I think that's a dangerous path to take. But it is fiction, so I will let it slide on this occasion. I didn't enjoy it quite as much as the Mindfuck series. I don't know why. I felt like the motivation for, of the Mindfuck series and why she was doing what she was doing, and also then the way the relationship developed between the two, I just preferred that slightly. I know other people felt differently and liked this one more. Yeah, you just cheer on. It was still a great book. It was very dark and it was very interesting and exciting and it says a dark romance. If you like that kind of thing, read it. And then of course I read the book series that broke TikTok. Like I, I think they were literal TikTok wars over this book. Battle lines were drawn. I am of course referring to Haunting Adeline by H.G. Carlton, who also wrote, what was that other book? What was Shark Sex book? Does it hurt? Yeah, does it hurt? Having read a couple of books by this author now, I'm saying I'm, I'm noticing a theme. I'm noticing a theme. We like, we like our romance dark and twisted and slightly fucked up, don't we? So, Haunting Adeline is a dark, very dark stalker romance featuring who all of the dubious non-consensual action that you could possibly need in a book. Genuinely, this book may be one of the scariest books I've read in a long time. I started to get the same vibe reading this as I did when I was reading Still Beating, which is that really kind of icky feeling in your chest where you're like, why am I reading this? Am I enjoying this? Should I be enjoying this? What am I doing to myself? Why am I torturing myself like this? I don't know, but here I am. Haunting Adeline we have a stalker he is a good stalker he's a nice guy he is a vigilante who's running an underground agency to take down sex traffickers he's like a good guy apart from the fact that he completely is obsessed with our heroine stalks her like literally not even like nice stalking not like you know checking out a facebook page on instagram literally breaking into her home and leaving roses in her house but it's okay because he cuts the thorns off it's all fine <laughs> Genuinely, this book may have one of the scariest scenes for me personally that I've ever read in any book ever, where he is literally standing outside her bedroom door. Her door is shut, she is in bed, and she knows that he is out there, and he doesn't come in, and she don't go out. And genuinely, I was just, my brain was melting at this point, because I was like, this is literally like my worst nightmare in the entire world, is knowing that someone is standing outside my door, or thinking they might be. Like, I regularly imagine there are people in my house when there aren't. This book just pushed every single one of my triggers, like, ugh, gross, genuinely terrified me. Add that to the part that there are literal ghost stories in this book as well, and there's a scary ass scene in a haunted house at, like, a theme park. The whole subtext of this book is that the heroine sort of gets off on being scared. I do not get off on being scared. I do not like being scared. So I'm probably the wrong audience for this book. But I did really enjoy it. I did really enjoy book one, I should say. But one haunting Adeline, I really did enjoy. It is very dark. Jesus Christ, it has so much, so much dubious and just plain 
non-consent stuff that please be wary if you are you know worried about that kind of thing please 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 give it some serious thought for reading it because don't come at me if you read it and then you're scared or you don't like it or you're offended by it because you cannot say you weren't warned and then book one ends on a cliffhanger which i don't want to spoil but it sets up book two upon read reading that cliffhanger and then reading the trigger warnings for book two hunting adeline i sort of had a bit of a premonition psychic episode of what to expect and i already kind of knew i wasn't going to like it as much because i knew we were going to go down a road that i wasn't going to enjoy quite as much and it really made me think about dark romance and the dark romance that we read and why we read it and all the rest of it and at what point does it literally just become a little bit torch porn you know what i mean like so how do i do this without spoiling book one there is a subplot about sex trafficking right like he is taking down sex traffickers so this is like a subplot underneath book one which becomes very very important in book two and adeline in particular goes through some freaking horrific stuff and at the beginning of book one you get this message this message here about not expecting like a quick reconciliation and at that point i was like we're gonna have chapters and chapters and chapters and chapters of her in horrific situations aren't we we just are and you do it's just that's like at least half of book one and it's it's just that thing eventually i'm going i don't i don't really understand why i'm reading it like i'd love someone to come and tell me from a psychology point of view like what it is we get out of this is it the the joy of being rescued from the horror at the end i don't is it the horror story that doesn't end up with death and disaster i don't know but i didn't enjoy book two as much because it just all of the sort of the setup of book one sort of felt like it didn't matter because it didn't really have any bearing on the story in book two in book one she's stressed about this stalker who is really obsessed with her who is scaring the pants off of her <laughs> and in book two that's like the least of her worries like she wishes she could go back to the time when she had a scary ass stalker breaking into a house that would be a that would be a vast improvement on her circumstances there are some fantastic bits in book one some fantastic bits like the way he reacts to other men who are interested in her she goes on a date with another guy that inspired me for all involved there's some really really sort of like standout good moments if you're into dark romance obviously but book two just lost me a little bit and i was honestly just really freaking glad it was over <laughs> by the time we got to the end it's one thing to have your heroine go through horrific circumstances for whatever plot reason but why do i need to see it like why do i need to have it graphically described to me why do i have to live through it with the thing i'd love someone to like psychologically break it down for me into why we read about it but it does just strike me as a bit like gratuitous just abuse and i just uh, i was honestly just really quite happy to have finished that book um, to put it down so on a very similar thread other books that one i think i'm the last person in the world to read and two i'm not entirely sure what to think about them was the four horsemen series by laura uh Talassa? Is that his man name? Thalassa? I don't know that one. You know the one I'm talking about. The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. We have Pestilence, War, Famine and Death. So each of the four books follows a very, very similar pattern. We meet the heroine who is in some sort of horrific circumstance where the horseman is eradicating all the people around her and then they end up meeting said horseman. They end up being either taken captive by said horsemen or going running away with them or being involved with them in some way there is always like a reason why and then eventually they follow horsemen around for a lot of time while horsemen kills thousands and thousands of people and then at the end it all gets resolved that is the basic plot of all four of these books and i did enjoy them like i did individually enjoy all of the books and arguably they're very entertaining they're very well written um they're very gripping and engaging but <laughs> There is no way of getting around it. Each of the four horsemen, who are meant to be sort of more physical embodiments and representations of their apocalyptic being, as opposed to actual living men who are doing bad things. But no matter how you want to swing it, each of them is the direct cause of the deaths of thousands of people. Like, pestilence, wherever he goes, gives people 
a horrific plague-like disease where they die in horrible uncomfortable just you know and there's no discrimination it's not if you're bad or good it's just men women children and we see it as as readers we see it we see whole families get wiped out and we're there with the heroine as she watches it and she's horrified and she's depressed and it's awful and you know war is literally eradicating cities and famine again is just like you know he's like just doesn't give a crap he's just killing people left right and center with these weird planty vine monsters that like strangle people and crush them and then of course we have death who literally walks through towns and people drop dead and yes okay in each of these books the heroine meets the horseman and the horseman sees humanity and he falls in love and through falling in love he decides that maybe he doesn't want to end the world because maybe there is some good in the world to be saved and he then stops and stops trying to destroy the world and we're just meant to go okay that's fine okay I found it uncomfortable in all of them. The death one particularly got to me. The heroine at the very beginning of the book goes into her family home and finds her entire family, her mum, her brothers and sisters, her nieces and nephews, the whole family just dead, just dead on the ground where they were standing in the middle of the... And however many months later, she's just okay with this and she's in love with death and they're running out riding off into the sunset but her family is still dead like her family are still dead i don't think i'd be okay with that i don't think there'd be any planet on which i'd be okay with that and i think another thing that sort of like i struggled with is i think i think but i'm not entirely sure that the point of the stories of the books was kind of that as the horsemen experienced humanity and love and all the rest of it they sort of become to realize that you know humanity isn't just a waste of time and it isn't you know all negative and maybe it should be saved i don't know maybe i'm thinking too deeply maybe it's just genuinely they enjoyed getting laid and they wanted to keep that happening i don't know <laughs> but i like to think it was meant to be bigger than that there was a scene in the first book pestilence where you meet an old couple who are kind to pestilence even though he is spreading this plague and even though he's wiping everybody out and killing everybody they are kind to him and they are nice and polite and very understanding that this is his job and he has to do this and it's not personal and all the rest of it and they're going to die and they're going to be together and it's all going to be okay and you can kind of understand why he would then start to get a bit of a grasp of humanity and go well they're not all horrible most of the humans that these horse meet are flipping awful like for most of these books, the horsemen meet the worst possible scummy humanity. Everybody who meets them tries to kill them in some way. And not even like in a little, like, you know, just a nice, pleasant, quick death way. But like torturing and abusing and chaining up. And I think one of them tries to crucify one of them. It just, you know, it's the worst examples of humanity you could possibly imagine. I'd want to bloody end the world too if I met these people. I think it would have been nice to have had just a few more examples of them meeting good examples of humanity. The kindness and the love and the nurturing that we are capable of showing sometimes to each other. That it does happen out there. I've heard of it occasionally. I think a bit more of that would have made me then go, that's why they decided not to end the world. As it was, I wasn't 100% sure if I knew what the point what was I meant to be taking away from it? And how was I meant to be okay with them having wiped out huge amounts of the population of Earth and it's just carrying on as if never, it never happened. It was fine. Everybody's happy. It's all good. It was really weird to simultaneously enjoy a book and also be left going, what? What am I meant to be? What am I meant to do with this? What am I meant to feel when I finish this book? Because I don't feel as euphoric and, and happy and hopeful as I would do at the end of a normal romance novel because half of the world is dead. <laughs> like, just, just gone. Just gone. We're not, we're not going to think about those because our main heroines and heroes are happy and they've got kids so it's all good. It was, it was an interesting read. Glad I read them. But interesting. And then, possibly the biggest I just got around to reading it of all time, I finally, I think it only took me maybe eight years, six, something like that, finally got around to reading A Court of Thorn and Roses and book two, A Court of Mist and Fury. Genuine question, am I the last person on earth to read these? Because I feel like I am. So I did try, as I said, I did buy this book 
years ago years and years and years and years and years ago and i did try to read it at the time and i got quite a long way into it i think i got like um quite a way i have done a whole reading vlog on this book which i will edit at some point and, and show you but i read it i did get through it this time i got through it mainly because i had spoiled the shit out of it so i knew exactly what to expect because the reason i stopped reading it is because it has a love triangle and as we have discussed i do not like love triangles i do not want to spend an entire book looking at you getting invested in one relationship to discover that that isn't the fucking relationship i'm meant to be getting invested in sorry i'm really swearing in this video i normally try not to swear in case my kids are watching girls if you're watching this do not swear but one obviously gets off to a very very strong start and um, i really really enjoy all the setup of this world all of the bits with um is it Feo? is that how you pronounce her name i don't know i've seen lots of different pronunciations in the world the whole thing with her uh, killing the Fae and then being taken to the court and all the rest of it. And then we meet Tamlin and we meet Lucian. And I remember when I first read it, I was like, so which one am I meant to be getting invested in? Which one am I meant to be gunning for at this point? Because I need to know that going into it. So I googled it and if I remember rightly, it's been a few years, the answer was neither. Don't get invested in either. And I was like, you what? Seriously? Are you taking the piss right now? So I put it down. <laughs> I put it down and I did not pick it up again for years. This year I finally picked it up again. Forewarned, forearmed, because now TikTok is a thing and I now know that there's this other character, this character called Reese Andy, who I haven't even met yet because I haven't got that far in this book and he's going to be important. So now I'm on the watch out and now I'm, I'm sort of like literally ignoring all of the stuff with her and Tamlin. I'm not even bothering. I'm not getting invested. I'm skipping past it. And I think obviously, honestly, <laughs> That was probably my reading experience of this one was that I just read it to get to book two. Like I was like, I've got to get through this one just to read book two. Having said that, I really, really enjoyed the end of this one. I love a good trials, like a mystical, magical trials. Extra points if it's like a bride trial or a husband trial. But I did enjoy the trials in this one, even though they weren't that scenario. I thought that was when it really picked up for me. That's when the story really got going. I was like, this is exciting stuff is happening. I know Rhysand's there as well, by the way, and he's like obviously in the background doing some sort of dirty dealing but i know he's important so it's all okay because i'm watching him and i just loved it and then obviously we end and it ends on this really sort of like <gasps> big moment what's gonna happen and then we get into book two and if i'm honest not much happens for quite a lot of the book like that's not technically true i know quite a lot does happen at the beginning of the book but it wasn't stuff i was particularly gripped by like, I was like, it wasn't a hard read. I mean, it's a big book. Look at the size of it. But I did enjoy it, and I did get through it quite quickly um, to say it's taken me eight years to read this series. It's fine. But I was not really massively gripped or invested in the first probably half to two-thirds of this book. I was a bit like, just kill me. Can they just get together now, please? Can we just see this all? What's going to happen? I just need to know what's going to happen now. And then it sort of started to pick up when they go to the summer court and when more action started to happen it started to pick up and then we have that wonderful wonderful um reveal i'm sorry if i'm spoiling this by the way i am literally assuming that everybody in the world has read this book already if you haven't i apologize don't sue me but then we get to the wonderful end section with them with a big confrontation with the king of highburn and her sisters turn up and lucian and tamlin turn up again and then there's this whole just the ending of this book got me excited again like I hadn't been excited about it for most of the book and I had been sort of thinking I really don't get the hype not that I'm not enjoying it and not that I wouldn't read more but I just don't understand why people rave about these books I'm a bit like mm, they're fine they're fine I've read better but the end of this book really did get me excited again I was like yes that's what I wanted I wanted these big dramatic moments I wanted excitement I wanted intrigue and a bit of romance thrown in there for good measure and now I need to go and buy book three because I don't own it and I need to know what happens next so I think we're getting an early Christmas present but yes finally started the Akhtar series I believe I have quite a few books to read yet but I will get there and I'm looking forward to it now I'm looking forward to it I quite like the world building I I'm enjoying the other characters I'm enjoying seeing where they all end up so yeah, um, I'm glad I've got around to it eventually, but it did take me a while. And finally, the last series that I want to talk about, my God, I've been talking for ages. Seriously, I need a drink. 
The last series that I want to talk about is the fabulous, the amazing, the just wonderful Stay a Spell series by Juliet Cross. I heard through the grapevine, as did everybody else, that the fourth book in the series is the fourth, or well, technically the fifth if you count the novellas. Anyway, the next book in the series, Resting Witch Face, was being released on Halloween and I was like, I want to read that, but before I do, I want to go back and I want to reread the other books in the series. So I read Wolf Gone Wild, Don't Hex and Drive, and then realised I'd missed one. I'd missed one. I hadn't read Always Practice Safe Hex. So I read that one for the first time. I then read The Walking in a Witchy Wonderland and then I read Resting, Resting Witch Face. Technically in November, but I'm including it now because it just makes sense. This series, I enjoy paranormal romance, but I do struggle to find paranormal romance that I enjoy, if that makes sense. I'm a big Cressley Cole fan. She is like my goddess of all things paranormal. Immortals After Dark is hands down one of my favourite book series of all times. I've read those books like hundreds of times over and over and over. And I struggle to find authors who do paranormal as well as I think she does. That perfect blend of paranormal action, magic, steam, but high romance as well. It's just, it's a difficult thing to get all that balanced and I don't think many people do it well. Juliet Cross does it so, so well. Like, if someone held me at gunpoint and maybe choose between these two series, I honestly to God don't know which one I'd pick because these books now just, they just make me feel so happy when I read them. Wolf Gone Wild from the first page the very first page, the first time we hear Alpha talk in Matteo's head and he's this sassy little bastard giving him some grief, I was just like, I'm gonna flip in love these books, aren't I? And that is exactly the case. I love the tone of them, I love the vibe, I love how they really sort of feel good and they're really happy and if you don't know this series, I feel like I'm talking to people who will know this series, like I'm just assuming, I'm assuming that you know what I'm talking about. If you do not know the series, this is a paranormal series set in New Orleans and it involves a family of sister witches, literally sisters, but also witches. And they live in a world where magic is a thing. There are paranormal beings, uh, notably werewolves, vampires, witches and grims, who are not, I think, a character that particularly reminds me of anything in particular. Um, they're quite original in terms of how they're written. And... Each book features a different sister, so book one is, is it Evie, book two is Isadora, book three is... Book three is then technically a series of short novellas based on the same characters. Some of them are, some are like extra epilogues for the previous books and others are little short stories featuring some of the other characters, some of them set up books later on. Book four is Livy's story and book five, finally. Finally, we get to see Jules and Reuben, the head vampire. Get it on. They're not too dark. Like, they feature... Some of them feature quite serious themes. Some of them have sort of, like, quite dramatic moments. But none of them get too dark that I think people would necessarily would be uncomfortable reading them. They all are very happy in terms of, like, the mood of them, the vibe of them. The families are very close. Uh, the heroes are all just lovely even the ones who are grumpy are just lovely and mushy in book four we get to see a grim for the first time and we get to find out more about their magic and how they work because we all sort of know what a werewolf is and we all sort of know what a vampire is but the grims are all a bit new and we get to see them in action and oh wow i was i mean really really enjoyed that far more than i expected to and then jules and reuben is a romance that has been sort of teased throughout the first four books and then we finally get to see that come to fruition in book five and man alive was it worth the wait like it was just mm, so freaking good i just loved it this series is just up there now with just one of my favorite series of all time it's just so incredibly wonderful i feel like the stay a spell series is paranormal romance for people maybe even if you're not really into paranormal romance like if you're like i don't really like vampire books you may still like these because they feel very contemporary in vibe, very easygoing, very light-hearted, there's lots of banter, there's lots of really funny bits. She keeps referencing other romance books, 
Lisa Claypass, Julia Quinn, El Eloisa James, and I just, they're romance novels written for people who love romance novels. I just, you can tell that this author reads a lot of romance and understands what her readers are looking for. Can't get enough, like, I reread all of these books and enjoyed them as much the second time as I had the first time. They felt new, they felt fresh, they felt exciting. I just, oh, I just love it. Can't, can't gush about it enough, genuinely. If you're going to read any series that I've spoken about in this entire video, read this series because really they just stellar. Absolutely. All the stars. Just love it. <laughs> I guess we'll leave it there. Still, we had a lot to catch up on, didn't we? I'm going to try and do this a little bit more frequently so that these videos can be a little bit shorter in future. But thank you very much if you did stick right to the end. If you did stay and you're still here, please let me know if you've read any of these books, like which of these are your favourite and what do you think I should read next? And I will speak to you very soon. <laughs> Bye.